experimentation, once you start thinking about it, a good enough virtual reality, it's hard to see how you'd ever know the difference. Uh, the philosopher Nick Bostrom has argued, in fact, maybe we should take this hypothesis very seriously. It's actually probable that we are in a virtual reality because in the whole history of the universe, there's going to be millions of simulated worlds as technology gets better and better and better. Only one original unsimulated world. Once you start thinking about it that way, what are the odds that I'm one of the lucky ones at level zero? It's far more probable that I'm somewhere down in the hierarchy of simulated universes. If so, I may be in a virtual reality right now. I see virtual reality as raising a bunch of new philosophical problems, but at the same time really illuminating a lot of old philosophical problems and throwing new light on them. So the problem of how do we know there's an external world? Skepticism about the external world is the view that we don't know that the external world even exists. And all the things we ordinarily take ourselves to know, like that I'm sitting down right now on a chair, might well be false. And I don't know them. Because, for example, it could be in a matrix, virtual reality, which is a mere simulation. That's a very seductive way to think about our relationship to the external world. That none of this may be real. But when you actually start to think about virtual reality in some detail, it's actually, to me, it's no longer obvious that this has to be seen as an illusion or as a deception. I think there's a real sense in which if I'm playing cricket inside a virtual reality, then I really am interacting with a virtual bat and a virtual ball and moving a virtual body. What I'm perceiving are these virtual bats and these virtual balls. And we live long enough in a virtual reality when I see myself as really being in touch with a certain kind of external reality. So some people think that virtual reality is really a second class reality and it would be a horrible place to live because although we're having all these experiences of pleasure and happiness, none of it is real. We're fundamentally deceived and we don't have real relationships with people. I'm not so sure about that. I'm inclined to think that if we're in a virtual reality and that's been our environment for a long time and we're interacting with it, it's not clear to me why that's any less real than being, say, in the mysterious wave function like quantum mechanical reality that we seem to find ourselves in today. More and more of the interactions we actually have are becoming virtual. I can at least imagine a day when, once we have so many virtual interactions, that life in this virtual world begins to seem at least as appealing as, say, a trip to Mars. It's going to be a new destination. It's going to be different from our old reality. But it's nonetheless a reality. I think, if you ask me, what we'd miss in a virtual reality is something like well, I'd miss contact with loved ones, but where there are other people who are participating, then I think we're actually having real relationships with real people. Another possibility is there'll be artificially intelligent creatures totally generated within the virtual reality. Well, if certain theses about the nature of the mind and intelligence are correct, those artificially intelligent creatures could be real people as well. So in some ways, that's actually why I'm most interested about virtual reality. It's a newfangled technology, which I might think raises some limited questions in the philosophy of technology. But at the same time, those questions kind of expand to take in so many of the great questions of philosophy. So that's David Chalmers. He's the one, by the way, that expressed um, the concern with consciousness as the really hard problem how to understand our, our consciousness um, especially self-consciousness uh, and keep in mind that uh, literally your consciousness uh, is the kind of thing that little creatures have they're aware of their surroundings so they clearly have consciousness um, and so we have conscious uh, consciousness, obviously, uh, experiences, and so on. But when we say self-conscious, we're talking about our thinking about ourself. So that you, you literally have a, a subjective self, you, uh, that are having an experience, and what you're doing, at least at the moment, is thinking about yourself. And when you do that, you need to have language, as far as I know, uh, in order for you to think about yourself, because uh, yourself 
in that sense, is a linguistic set of characteristics that you think of as yourself. You might have your name, you might have descriptions of yourself that you, you believe to be accurate, uh, you know, usually come from your significant others, which is why those significant others are significant, because we wouldn't have a conception of ourself uh, unless we have significant others that help us understand who we are and when we're right, when we're wrong. It's why being married for a male is so important, because otherwise you won't have a woman who's telling you where you're wrong, which really, really helps, by the way. That could also be funny. Uh, my response to the question if you know a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to make a sound uh, uh, is you know is and there's no one there to hear it does it make a sound and my my response that I've been sending to folks is you know the the <clears throat> somewhat similar joke you know if there's a man saying something and there's no woman there to hear him is he still wrong you know not just funny, it's kind of a practical uh, thing. Um, but when you're, you're thinking about you know, virtual reality, the matrix is brought up almost all the time because I, I think everybody's seen the movie, so it's good to refer to that. Um, uh, virtual objects are real objects. In the virtual reality that we're experiencing. I mean, you know, when I play golf, I'm really hitting a ball. I'm really, uh, you know, playing on a golf course. Uh, but keep in mind, it's it's digitally uh, created by some really wonderful uh, uh, creative folks uh, that have created these courses. Uh, that um, use the you know one of the things that uh, he he briefly showed. Uh, was someone using the program with their, their Oculus uh, that's called, um, uh, it's a painting program, and it's called? Oculus? Yes, she, she was painting in 3D, um, and it's called Tilt Brush. That's the name of it. Uh, that was, in fact, the, you know, the very first reason I bought my first Oculus was because I wanted to try that out. And I succeeded in downloading the program and discovering that it's, it is a lot of fun. It's very uh, uh, relaxing to be painting. Uh, uh, I, you know, my favorite is, is to let someone else paint something uh, that I can be in the middle of. So, so like Starry Night, someone uh, did the, the, uh, the trick of painting uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night in 3D, and so you can literally be standing there and, and, and you know, see it from all different sides, and plus they added all kinds of special effects, so this, every, the stars are all trink, twinkly and, and, and stuff. Plus you can listen to music and so on. But the neat thing about it is, of course, that you're in a 3D uh, experience, so when you're using your brush with all the different colors and everything, you can, you can draw this way, this way, this way, this way, but you can also draw this way and around you, et cetera. Uh, so, so it's really fun. Uh, um, it also requires an awful lot of skill and talent. Remember, I don't have any talent. So I, I like it, it's fun, but I, I uh, plus the other thing is, is when you create art with it, how the heck do you share it with someone else? You know, the only way really would be for them to to you know, put your set on and, and, and look at your your art. Uh, I think there's a way to sh to like upload it to a shared site and so on, but uh, it's much more it's complex. Too. I do 3D printing. I don't have any programs for virtual space, but you can sculpt in the virtual space. So you can sculpt in a virtual space and and print it with the 3D. Oh, of course, of course, you would have to, you know, for those new things. So. Here's the, the complexity associated with this, is we can talk about virtual objects, and we do want to say virtual means that there's a quality difference between that virtual object that works within a program in a device. 
that's different than you know you know the the devices you have you know in your house you know uh, you can't use a digital device uh, to cut up your ham sandwich you know nor can you eat a ham sandwich that's really going to give you any protein unless it's a real ham sandwich so so when we live in these virtual worlds they really are rewarding um, you know the you know the the idea of the uh, uh, the context of Ready Player One is that we live on a world that's way too small for the number of people there are, and we don't have enough wealth for everybody to have a whole lot of anything. Uh, but we do have these virtual reality headsets that we could all go on, and there's an infinite amount of worlds that we can create out there. So we can really enjoy life as long as we're in our virtual reality this the, what really sucks is you've got to come back to eat and sleep so you can't just live out there constantly um, plus of course you need the energy in order to create these computer generated virtual worlds uh, so there is a, a requirement to actually have a real life uh, um, one of the other other books much older than ready player one was um, uh, Snow Crash by um, Paul, no, not Paul Anderson, uh, Neil Stephenson. Uh, uh, Snow Crash. Did they ever make a movie out of that? I don't think so. I think they are making one. Though. They are making one. Um, but, uh, Snow Crash is, is another example where the individual, the main character, lives in a uh, uh, a storage bin in California along the coast, uh, uh, you know, and rides a motorcycle, um, and and you know his life is absolutely impoverished and miserable, but on the internet, he's a world hero, uh, and saving the world, and and uh, 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 everyone respects him and honors him and so on, and. and in fact, he's so important that in the real world, people are actually trying to kill him. <laughs> so, so the virtual reality and the, the physical reality actually merge, you know, in this uh, 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 novel, uh, which is what cyberpunk, I think, yeah. is the the the, uh, the type of, of novel it is. But so here you go, you know, this is art, and it's actually quite old now um, by comparison. But the, uh, the problem still is, okay, if we want to say something is true and we're using statements and we're trying to figure out if this statement is true or not, uh, we're creating worlds where virtual reality creates objects that are true. And we want to say that these are true in that virtual reality, but obviously we have to use our understanding of the context. These are true within that particular context. And there is a big difference, of course, between those kinds of things and our actual reality. Um, and when we, um, good, that's still there. And that's still there. And that's still there. I lost it. Ah, here we go. So, what are we talking about? Today, October 22nd, we're supposed to be talking about propositional logic. Propositions, at, at, at root, are problematic for us. I mean, we can go back and say, okay, well, Aristotle gives us statements, A-E-I-O. There's those four kinds of statements, and you get um, categorical reasoning. And so everything that we can say that's true or false is based on a correspondence between what we say and reality. Whether it's virtual reality or physical reality, good question. Uh, what about mathematics? One plus one equals two. Everyone agrees that's true. Even if you don't agree, you, you agree. You have to. It's against the law. 
for you to disagree with that. Um, so 1 plus 1 equals 2. Trouble, of course, is there are no things that are ones. Pure ones. I mean, I've got lots of one things, but 1 itself plus 1 equals 2 is true. And that's, of course, you know, true of all mathematical objects. They're virtual objects. And not even the same as the virtual objects that we're talking about in these computer games and so on. We're in 